Hey everybody, I'm Tom Tullis. This is the Tomb of 3D Printed Horrors, and today we are going to take a look at printing 28mm miniatures out on your home FDM 3D printer. I know a lot of people say you can't get good results, uh, and that simply isn't true. If you know how to set your slicer up, you can get very good results on a very inexpensive printer. Uh, in this case, these lizard men and the skeleton I'm putting on screen here. Those were both printed with a $230 Creality Ender 3 printer, so you do not need an expensive printer to get results like this. You just need to know how to set your slicer up. Now, before we get into this, I want to cover something uh, that is key to understanding when trying to get miniatures to come out well on your home FDM printer, and that is the concept of the glass transition point. Now, what is that? Simply put, glass transition is the temperature at which a hard, solid, brittle plastic will start to deform and soften. Now, I'm not talking about turn to a liquid. I'm not talking about uh, PLA when you heat it to 200 degrees and it actually turns into a liquid and can be extruded. I'm talking about, I think with PLA, the glass transition point is somewhere around 85 or 90 degrees. And what this is, is if you imagine having a solid cube of plastic, the sides are perfectly polished, they're mirror smooth, and you start heating it, the glass transition point is the point when those super glossy uh, side surfaces go to a matte finish, when it becomes slightly soft, when it stops being so brittle and you can actually maybe dig your fingernail through it or begin to bend it. That is the glass transition point, and that's something we're going to look at here because that is key to understanding and getting a good miniature. Now, the first mistake I see a lot of people make on printing miniatures on a home printer is they look at what the absolute minimum layer height their printer can print, and that's what they print at. And that actually will work against you. You do not need super thin layer heights to print miniatures and that look good. They can actually work against you and create more side artifacts and uh, increase stringing. Now, if you look at this image, the nozzle in all cases is going to give off radiant heat. Now there's nothing you can do about this. You have to print at a high enough temperature to reliably extrude the plastic. The problem is that heat is given off as radiant heat from the nozzle and if you're printing at too thin of a layer height that radiant heat can actually cause prior layers to reach their glass transition point again and soften and deform on you. So the only way around this is printing slightly thicker layers. Now when you do this the thicker layers act as a thermal barrier. It will prevent the radiant heat from actually deforming prior printed details. And that's key to this for when you're printing something like a miniature with very tiny things like noses and fingers and weapons. You want to keep those layers that you've already laid down solid. You want to keep them to hold their detail. If they reheat again and soften, then your miniature's not going to look as crisp. So for me, I like printing somewhere between 0.08 and 0.1 layer height. Once you get down to 0.5, or 0 0.05, 50 microns, it actually becomes so thin that you're causing prior layers to re-reach their glass transition point, and that works against you. Now, the other thing I see people doing and I strongly disagree with is printing completely solid miniatures. This works against you for a number of reasons, and we'll go through each of them here. The first is... None of us has a printer that the extruder is tuned to a perfect 100% extrusion weight rate. It's not possible. This is an analog process. Uh, the slightest deviation in filament width, uh, among a host of other reasons, means you cannot reliably print 100% uh, extrusion. Um, you can get close. You can get very close tuning it, but it will never be a dead 100%. Now, what happens? Well, if you look at this diagram, you have your shells, you have your previous layer, and you're putting your infill in, and I've got this exaggerated a little bit just for the effect, but it gives you an idea of what's going on. As you print that plat molten plastic out, if there's not enough room for it, if you're over extruding, the only where direction for it to go is upward. And as it does that, every layer builds upon the previous one, and you get more and more of an overage. Now, what's going to happen to all that plastic? Well, in some cases, it's going to get pushed out towards the edge and create a blob or a zit, or if it's a wide enough area, you're going to actually see a pretty sizable uh, deviation in your layer line. 
other times people uh, contact me and will say, you know, hey, I'm trying to print a miniature out. I've got retraction cranked up to seven, eight, nine millimeters, and I'm still getting stringing. Well, the reason is it has nothing to do with your retraction. You're printing a solid mini. That plastic has nowhere to go, and when that nozzle contacts it, it's dragging it off as a string. It has nothing to do with your retraction. It has nothing to do with the filament inside the nozzle. It's all of the excess filament you're printing outside of the nozzle that's causing this. So again, 100% uh, infill is going to work against you. If you imagine it like this, filling this uh, pie tin with water, you know, the sides of the pie tin are your walls that you're printing, and the water is your infill. At some point, that infill has to go over the edges. It will not stay contained forever. And there is absolutely no reason to print a miniature with 100% infill. It actually doesn't uh, gain you anything, and it, as we've seen, it can work against you. So, what should you do? Well, for me, I like printing my miniatures with three shells. This is with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, and let's do a little math here. The total wall width on either side of this mini is going to be 1.2 millimeters um, because it's three layers and each layer is 0.4 millimeters. So 0.4 times 3 is 1.2 millimeters. You double that because you have a wall on each side. That means any single layer of your miniature, if it's thick enough, is going to have a, without any infill, is going to be 2.4 millimeters thick of plastic. That's a tenth of an inch of plastic for a one inch tall miniature. That's insane. If you can break through that, you're going to just break your miniature regardless of what the infill is. So if you look at this image, in the case of the skull of the uh, skeleton, three layers will print on both sides. And I've got infill cranked up a little bit here, so it gives it a supporting structure. Uh, in this case, the infill is not for strength. It's to give a lattice work for printing the shells on. Uh, which will actually help you with things like overhangs. But if you look at the more critical area, the spear, the spear, um, the spear cannot really print with three full walls on each side or three full shells on each side. It's actually printing, um, or I guess it is close there to three, but it's not getting any infill at all. So if even if you were printing your miniature with a complete solid fill, you're not going to get any more strength in critical areas like legs and ankles and weapons than you would with just a straight three layers because they're not thick enough. Um, in this image, I'm showing the ankle area. Again, it's just barely big enough for the three shells, no infill. So adding 100% infill will not gain you anything here. And these are the weak point of the miniatures. If anything's going to break, it's going to be these thinner areas. So the 100% infill doesn't gain you anything as far as strength for the key areas or the weak areas. And it will work against you on other parts of it with stringing and the overages on the sides. Uh, if you look at the torso here, same thing. Three shells is more than sufficient to give you a strong miniature. You don't need 100% uh, infill. Uh, in this case, the arms are only printing with two shells on each side. They aren't even big enough for the three, let alone having 100% infill. Now, two final reasons not to print solid minis, in my opinion. First is contraction forces. You're dealing with a molten plastic. As that plastic cools, it contracts. That's basic thermodynamics. Um, if you have a solid layer of molten plastic as it contracts, the most obvious effects of that contraction are going to be at the outer edges aimed towards the center. Uh, you're not going to see the center of the mini, so nobody cares about that. The worst effects of the contraction are going to be the outer edges, and that is what you do see. Those are going to want to curl inwards and upwards. Um, by having a miniature that is just outer shells with some space in the middle, like say 50% infill, you're giving more flex to those walls. that They can better absorb those contraction forces without uh, deforming as much. So you're going to get, again, a better looking miniature. Finally, um, there is the issue of kinetic energy if the miniature is dropped. Now, uh, the kinetic energy of the object is determined by the mass and the speed. Well, speed, the falling speed is constant. You know, we all learned that in high school physics class. Uh, it doesn't matter how heavy or how light your miniature is, they all drop at the same rate. But the mass of the object, the mass of the miniature, does come into play for the kinetic energy that is going to be uh, 
affecting the miniature when it's dropped on the floor or on the tabletop. So the heavier you make your miniature, the greater that kinetic energy is and the greater the chance that you're going to break your miniature. Now, we've already established that the thinnest points of the miniature, like weapons and ankles and arms, aren't going to be affected one way or the other by how much infill you use in your miniature. They're just going to be affected by uh, the width of the walls at 28 millimeter scale. So you're not gaining anything there as far as strength. And those are going to be the first things to break. What you are doing by adding more plastic than necessary to the miniature is you are increasing that kinetic energy of an impact. You're creating more mass, which when the miniature falls is going to create more energy for the impact and a greater chance of breaking it. So again, no reason to have 100% infill, but a lot of reasons not to. Okay, before we get into the actual Cura settings I'm using, if you would like to use my uploaded uh, Cura profiles for both miniatures and terrain, all you have to do is when you have Cura open, go to profile on the right hand side there, click it, pull down to manage profiles, and that will open a preferences dialog box. In that, you click import and select the profiles that you want to import. And once you do that, those profiles will appear in your profile listing after that point. So that's all you got to do uh, to load my uh, pre-done profiles for Cura for the Ender 3 and CR10. Now, uh, if you want to create your own profile or use my settings as a guide for your printer, if you're not using Cura or something, uh, let's walk through these one by one things that I've done on this uh, to get the results that I've shown earlier in the video. Um, for In both cases, the lizard men and the uh, skeleton, I'm using 0.1 layer height. And in all honesty, you really don't need to go any thinner than this for a 28 millimeter miniature. You'd, I don't notice any increase in detail and I actually see a decrease in surface quality. I get increased stringing when I go down to 0.5. Uh, I see blobs and zits on the side of the model simply be, uh, from the radiant heat causing prior layers to hit those glass transition points and it just creates more problems than it's worth. And it, again, uh, those miniatures came out wonderfully at 0.1 and it totally eliminates the glass transition point issue for prior layers. Now, next down is the initial layer height. I always print around 0.2 for that. It just gives me better layer adhesion. Uh, below that, line widths, uh, if you're printing at point with a 0.4 nozzle, just keep those at 0.4. Um, I don't adjust my initial line uh, width. I find that printing a layer height of 0.2 works just fine without doing that. Uh, wall thickness, now this is where a lot of people disagree with me. They think you can get by with just two walls or it would be 0.8 millimeter wall thickness. And I don't like this. Uh, if you're printing with 100% infill, yeah, that's great. Um, for me, I prefer printing with less infill, as discussed earlier, and thicker shells. And uh, it gives me all the strength I'm going to get uh, regardless of what the infill is for thinner areas. In this case, the spear and the ankles. Uh, in the neck of the skeleton. Those are going to print absolutely as thick as they possibly can at three shells, regardless of what infill is. So uh, again, it's just my preference, but I do like three shells. Now, top bottom thickness. Um, for me, 0.8 is absolutely minimum. For, for, for a miniature, it's the minimum. When I'm doing terrain, I'll even go up to a, a full millimeter thickness for those just for durability. Um, Top bottom pattern, uh, I prefer lines over concentric. I just think it looks better. Uh, this is, if you're in Cura and you see the setting, compensate wall overlaps, make sure this is off. This creates so many problems uh, with surface quality that I've found. Uh, I've tried it with a number of different uh, permutations with other uh, settings in here, and I can never get it to produce I understand the concept behind it where you'd have two walls slightly overlapping. It reduces the extrusion on the second pass so that they don't overlap too much. Um, but what I'm seeing is that the extrusion capabilities of most printers don't... Uh, they, they aren't fine enough that it can compensate fully for that, and you either start getting gaps where you don't want them. Uh, it just isn't worth it. Just turn that off. Uh, now, the below that, fill gaps between walls, you do want that on, and you do want it set to everywhere. That is very important for small items. 
Now, infill, the absolute minimum you would want to print would be about 30%. I find 50 works great. It really doesn't add much print time to the miniature, but it does give a good solid lattice work for uh, attaching those outer shell walls to, which just gives you better overhangs and stuff on the miniature. Uh, now, temperature. This is something that is individual to the printer because thermosistors, the measuring device, the sensor on your hot end uh, can be different. Uh, and every brand of filament is different and also same brands of filament between colors and depending on how much how long it has been exposed to moisture can make a difference. For me, I am printing with eSun PLA Pro. Now, why is that? Well, eSun PLA Pro has a higher tensile strength than standard PLA. Well, what is that? Well, tensile strength, uh, uh, materials can have two strengths. They have tensile strength and compression strength. Um, the key to anything small like this is the tensile strength. Tensile strength is simply the flexibility of the material. Having a higher tensile strength means it's going to be more resistant uh, to breakage. It's going to have more flex to it. Esun PLA Pro has a higher tensile strength or more flexibility than standard PLA, say from Hatchbox or Inland or uh, any of the other popular brands. So for me, it's worth a little bit extra price. I think I pay about $23 a roll, a kilogram for it for the gray, but it works great. And I'm usually able to drop a mini onto the floor. And in this case, something like the spear wouldn't break with it. It would have more flex. So um, I'm printing that at 195 degrees temperature. It will reliably extrude it that. Now, if you're printing with hatchbox, I've cranked my hatchbox miniatures down to 190 or in even some cases 185 and had good results with it but again i'm using eSun pla pro here so 195 is about as low as i can get it now why do you want it low well it goes back to that radiant heat issue the lower you can keep the nozzle the lower the temperature you can keep the nozzle um the less radiant heat there is and the less uh chance you're going to have of causing lower layers to hit that glass transition point so Keeping it low also allows the cooling fans, the part cooling fans, to cool it faster and get it to harden faster to maintain uh, sharp detailing. If you were printing, say, at 205, uh, you would notice more drooping on overhangs. Small details would not be as sharp. So, again, 195 may not work for you. You may have to print, depending on what you're using, at 200, maybe even 205, although I really can't imagine any PLAs requiring that for a miniature. Um, but start with 195. Anytime you adjust temperatures in a case like this, never go more in increments more than five degrees at a time. It's amazing what a difference can happen with PLA in just five degrees. So if you start at 195 and you're seeing under extrusion, you're going to have to go to 200. If you're printing at 195 with Hatchbox and you're seeing um, more issues with overhangs, you can go down to 190 and maybe even 185, but try 190 first. Now, first layer, uh, I always print a little hotter just to get better adhesion, in this case 205. Uh, next frame here, we're build plate, uh, 60 is sufficient. You don't need to go any higher than that. Um, for me, on the Ender 3, I am printing, I find I get better miniatures when I dial the flow back a little bit. And in this case, I've got it at 95. That may cause under extrusion for people. And if it does, if you're seeing gaps and lines, put it back to 100. This is just what works for me on my printer. But uh, it has a noticeable effect on reducing stringing. Um, it keeps blobs from forming on the outer surface where you might have a little bit of over extrusion and stuff. Uh, the 95 just works beautifully on my Ender 3 as seen in those pictures at the beginning of the video. Now, speed. Speed is one of those really funny things and you have to... Um, understand what's going on here and how this is going to play with acceleration and jerk. And this is where I see a lot of uh, profiles online. They set super slow speeds, but they'll have a jerk that's higher than their speed setting, which is counterproductive. And we'll get to that later. Um, in this case, I'm printing at 45 millimeters per second for the uh, initial speed and everything is calculated off of that. And that seems high for a miniature, but let me explain why I'm doing it. First and foremost, that 45 millimeters per second is just a base number. Key numbers, such as the outer wall speed, are always uh, 
figured from that core number. So I'm not actually printing at 45 millimeters per second. Key areas such as the outer wall speed are actually printing at half of that, in this case 22.5 millimeters. And that may still seem, I've seen miniature profiles that print at, you know, insanely slow speeds like 10 or 12 millimeters per second, which again, keeps that nozzle over an area longer, allows more radiant heat to transfer to any given area below it, and causes prior printed layers to hit their glass transition point. You want to keep this nozzle moving at a fairly fast rate to keep that from happening. Um, yes, theoretically, slower speeds produce a better miniature, but that's just in accordance with the speed. It's not taking into account that radiant heat. So you've got to strike a balance between the two. Now for me, what I've found with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle printing at 0.1 or even as low as 0.08 layer height, this 22.5 millimeter per second outer wall speed works fine. You get nice sharp details, but the nozzle is moving fast enough. It's not heating those lower layers as rapidly as if you print it at a slower pace. So, and it actually is going to be a little slower than this, but I'm going to get to that in a moment when I get to jerk. But for right now, 22.5 for the Ender 3 works fantastic. Now, acceleration, um, you do want, if you're printing in Cura, go ahead and click Enable Acceleration Control, but dial it way down. I've got mine at 300. Now, I have done tests upwards of 500, and it still looks good. It cuts a few minutes off the miniature print time, but not enough to really warrant... Uh, the change in quality. I find that 300 works great. It still gives you a good acceleration number, but it's not causing issues with surface quality. So uh, 300 is what I like. Now this is the one that's key, print jerk. Now what is that? I've got mine set to five. And to understand what this is, um, if you imagine you're in a car traveling 80 miles an hour and you slam on the brakes like the printer does when it, the print head stops to change direction and print in the opposite direction or something, that's going to hurt. That's going to jerk you an awful lot if you're traveling at full speed then immediately stop. It's basic inertia. An object at motion tends to stay in motion. An object at rest tends to stay at rest. Um, what jerk is, is setting a number for the printer to decelerate to before it will come to a full stop. So in this case, I'm telling it to go from the 22.5 millimeter print speed of the outer walls before it comes to a complete stop that jerk, it's going to decelerate to five millimeters per second briefly and then stop. And that's just going to make it uh, take some of those inertial forces off of the print head, which means you're going to have a better looking miniature. Now, uh, I've seen other profiles out there where the jerk is actually, and I don't know why, uh, I've printed with them and I think it's, this is actually the cause of some of the problems with them, but they actually have the jerk set to a higher, uh, number than what the print speed is. So again, this is something to look out for. Uh, jerk should always be lower than your print speed. And that's why now, um, Z hop when retracted, I know people like this. I hate it. Uh, it produces, all kinds of artifacts over your print. Um, I really strongly recommend turning this off whenever possible. And not just for minis, I turn it off for terrain. I hate it in all cases. Um, enable print cooling obviously should be on. Uh, I usually have my fans turn on the full speed uh, with the second layer, or in this case, 0.2 millimeter layer height, simply because the first layer, as we discussed earlier, was set to 0.2 millimeter. Um, and finally, I get a lot of people asking me about using adaptive layers on miniatures, and I strongly recommend against it. Um, I played a lot with it. I think eventually it's going to get to the point where it will be the choice setting for printing miniatures. It's not there yet. Um, one of the things that I see most uh, as far as a problem with using this setting is the under extrusion it creates. If you look at this photo, there is definite bands of under extrusion on the skull and all throughout the length of the spear shaft and even down on the rear of the right boot um, in the rear photo there. Uh, other things I notice is increased banding from uh, the individual layers, uh, areas like the uh, sword scabbard in the rear view that were visually perfectly smooth with a standard consistent 0.1 layer height. Uh, now there is definite banding. Uh, 
Uh, other issues was were increased stringing throughout the model, and also just lots more little blobs and zits all over it that ha have to be cleaned off. It just isn't worth the extra effort. I mean, this miniature would probably take a good 15 minutes, 20 minutes to clean up, and all you're really gaining is a smoother top surface on the skull and on the ground, but that's, you know, meant to be rocky anyways. I'm not too worried about the base. The So the only real benefit here is the skull. And with a consistently uh, printed 0.1 layer height, you could get a matching skull uh, surface with about five seconds of rubbing some 800 grit sandpaper over the standard printed miniature. So again, you're just creating a lot more work for yourself and not really gaining anything from it over printing a consistent layer height uh, with the 0.1 or 0.08. All right, um, final thing I want to touch on very briefly is retraction. Uh, my settings for my Ender 3, I'm using five millimeter retraction distance with a speed of 40 millimeters per second. Um, I'm going to go into a separate video later on with a lot more detail on retraction. I don't want to spend that much time on it here. Uh, but just very briefly, um, if your, re your retraction distance is set too large, you're retracting and feeding the same section of filament more times in, in cases where you have a lot of tight detail with a lot of retractions. That's going to wear a certain length of filament down more from that feeder gear grinding into it, and that can actually lead to under, uh, under extrusion. So I don't like to have very long retraction distances. It's just something I found that creates more hassles than it's worth. So uh, for me, the best balance is five millimeters of distance and about a 40 millimeter uh, speed. I've done speeds up to 55 on my Ender 3. I did not notice any appreciable um, increase in retraction effectiveness, so I backed it back down to 40, simply because the slightly slower speed does not dig into that filament as much and you don't risk that under extrusion. So again, I'm going to touch on um, retraction in a lot more depth in another video, but just not this one. Okay, that pretty much does it up for how to print out 28 millimeter miniatures on your home FDM printer. Uh, these, this video was mainly designed to go through and talk about slicer settings. I will work or touch on in another video on using supports, but that's a video in and of itself. So thank you very much for watching. If you would, please click that subscribe button in the bottom right hand corner.